I am New York. Yes, I'm New York. I am New York. Yo soy Nueva York. Solo New York. Just me New York. We are New York. Welcome to Diverse City, where we explore New York City's eclectic enclaves, one neighborhood at a time. I'm Zyphus LeBron. This month, we're in Sunset Park, Brooklyn. The neighborhoods had a long immigrant history, from the English to the Finns to the Dutch back in the 1600s. Later, Norwegians settled here. Their legacy is still evident in the neighborhood in the form of the many churches they built. The more recent wave of immigrants to Sunset Park are Latino and Chinese, many attracted by the area's relatively affordable housing prices. However, as in so many places, residents fear being pushed out as rents rise in this gentrifying neighborhood. One of the major factors fueling this trend is the development of the facility in which I'm standing, Industry City. The 35-acre facility has a history that dates back to the late 1800s when it was a complex of manufacturing businesses. Now it's advertised as a campus for high-end and luxury brands. On this edition, the debate over development. Is Industry City hurting or helping the community? Pushing their luck, Sunset Park's Chinatown expands beyond its original roots. Plus, remembering the neighborhood's nearly forgotten Norwegian roots. And a cemetery that's got a life of its own. Those stories and more coming up as we explore Sunset Park, Brooklyn. I'm standing inside Industry City. The six million square foot complex is at the center of a raging debate about Sunset Park's future. On one hand, there's the developers who are promoting the billion dollar transformation of massive warehouses into pristine high-end facilities as the kind of innovative investment the area needs. On the other are longtime residents who blame these neighbors for the spike in rents and displacement of long established businesses. I tried to learn a little bit more about both sides of this argument. One word comes to mind when walking through Industry City. Sprawling. The complex is home to eateries, a high-end chocolate store. The Brooklyn Nets even have a training facility and their corporate office on these grounds. And that's just the tip of the proverbial iceberg. Industry City is so large that there are maps like these along walls throughout the compound that show the 10 buildings that stretch along 2nd and 3rd avenues between 32nd and 37th streets. All this is only part of a $1 billion rezoning and redevelopment proposal for the waterfront facility. Back in 1895, Industry City was a state-of-the-art warehousing and distribution center, but it became virtually derelict in the early 2000s. Now, developers Jamestown Belvedere Capital and Angelo Gordon and Company have a plan to use this space to create more than 20,000 jobs citywide. Industry City CEO Andrew Kimball appeared on CUNY TV's Stoller Report in 2014 to speak about plans for retail stores during the initial stages of the rebuilding process. The primary focus on the retail initially is retail that is an amenity for the businesses moving in there. So, you know, you mentioned the, the BQE and that has been the natural dividing line between the residential side of Sunset Park and the working waterfront. We need to create places that people can come get something to eat, for instance, in these buildings. So as we go for 2,400 employees where we were last August to 3,600 today to 15,000 where we hope to be in another eight years, there need to be interesting places for people to go eat. Despite that, all is not well on the waterfront. These industrial uh, parts of the community, these areas where you've had a large walk-to-work community working at jobs that pay really well have been turned into destination locations for the privileged. Elizabeth Yampier is the head of Uprose, an environmental justice group that's heading a coalition of community organizations and churches that say that Industry City is contributing to the gentrification taking place in the neighborhood. They basically tell our community that this is a place where they can work. And they, what they don't tell them um, is that they might be able to get a job there, but they won't be able to afford to live here anymore. And what they do, which is um, 
dishonest is they, they make it seem as though displacement and gentrification is happening everywhere that they can't control that when they are really the the folks that are generating that displacement both primary and secondary in Sunset Park. According to NYU's Furman Center for Real Estate and Urban Policy, rents in Sunset Park went up nearly 25 percent between 1990 and 2014. Those rent hikes forced out people like Ting Ting Fu and her family. Fu works with Yam here at Uprose and is part of the community alliance called Power, Protect Our Working Waterfront Alliance. She says the neighborhood is nothing like what she remembers. I grew up here and back then, you know, we really didn't need a block party permit for a block party. We just sort of like shut down, open the fire. We didn't need the fire trucks to come in to open the fire hydrant. We just did it on our own. Um, and block parties would just happen. But now it's so hard to even organize a block party because people, they don't want the loud music. They don't want kids running up and down the blocks. They don't want barbecue in the front. And so that's sort of like one of the main things that I see changing and it's really sad. Dr. Lillian Pola McKenna also grew up in Sunset Park and admits that things have changed since she moved away. She heads Opportunities for a Better Tomorrow a nonprofit that provides job training and placement, as well as mentorship for entrepreneurs from poor communities. She says that Industry City is making strides to be a good corporate neighbor. They've partnered with OBT and City Tech to create the Innovation Lab. The lab's mandate, in part, is to train locals and place them in jobs in the facility. I think the Innovation Lab, for us, has reflects a, a commitment from a variety of different parties. So you have a nonprofit, you have higher ed, CUNY, um, you have you know a private entity, Industry City, which of course they have their own interests, but they've demonstrated a significant commitment to the work that's happening here. Sort of roll their sleeves up, let's sit at the table, let's figure out what this can look like. And that's, that's refreshing. But Yampier says what they're doing isn't enough. Despite Industry City's claims, that they've already created more than 8,000 jobs since 2013. We don't know what those numbers are. We don't know how many real jobs. We don't know whether those are union jobs. We don't know whether those are jobs that would provide uh, growth for, for people in our community or whether they're entry-level jobs where people are just cleaning up and serving. Paula McKenna says that the problem is more nuanced than that. So in Sunset Park, 42% of adults don't have a high school diploma. That's, it's a challenge that we, that we have to overcome. Uh, and so whether it's through Opportunities for a Better Tomorrow or any of the other uh, education and workforce partners in the community, it's really getting people on track to both get the credentials that they need, but also build the skills that are necessary to access the jobs that are here right now, but also certainly the jobs that will come. Still, Yam Pierre is not certain of Industry City's willingness to be a good corporate citizen. She says that the developers have deep pockets and have gone on a charm offensive in order to get everything that they've wanted. They have been working really hard to do an end run around us, dropping money all over Sunset Park, giving money to churches, to community organizations, doing what has always been done to us, giving out trinkets so they could take away a community soul. Now that a lot of the refurbishing has taken place, developers are moving forward with their rezoning efforts that could see vertical development of the facility. Yam Pierre and her coalition say they're going to continue educating members of the community for the fight that lies ahead as they await word on this rezoning. This is a David and Goliath fight, and we know that. But just because it is doesn't mean that we're not gonna fight. We have to. If we were to give up every time there's a big fight in front of us, where would we be as a people? We wouldn't even be talking to each other right now. We wouldn't exist. You may be familiar with Manhattan's Chinatown or the one in Flushing, Queens. What you may not know is that Brooklyn has the fastest growing Chinatown. It's already larger than the one in Manhattan. Gary Pierre Pierre reports on the bustling area that has more of a working class vibe than its better known counterparts. In 1984, feeling squeezed out by rising rent in Manhattan's Chinatown, 
Sonny Mui decamped to a remote corner of Brooklyn and opened a market. Since then, he's seen Sunset Park's Chinatown grow to become one of the most vibrant neighborhoods in the city. When we come, we see uh, not so many uh, Chinese people, but uh, since the 911, the uh, more uh, the Chinese people coming uh, in this uh, community. When we come here, the business is really slow, but uh, since we are doing and going, and more uh, new immigrants coming, and that we are business to get their backup. When we started, and it's only uh, me and my wife, but now I, 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 I hire more than uh, 30 people. Mui was part of a huge migration of Chinese immigrants, mostly Cantonese, who now dominate the area between 6th Avenue, 4th Hamilton Parkway, and along 56th and 40th Streets in Sunset Park. Those streets form the boundaries of Chinatown, home to 70,000 of the estimated 200,000 Chinese residents in Brooklyn. While the original settlers were Cantonese, in the last 15 years or so, more immigrants from Fujian province have moved in to balance the Chinese ethnic mix. So you started telling other senators, uh, Andrew Cousins and, and uh, other folks, Jeff Klein, uh, you know, and, 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 you know. Kenneth Chu, a community leader, has helped newly arrived Chinese and Asian immigrants adjust to life in America. He moved here in the early 90s from Manhattan's Lower East Side. For a long time, superstition kept the community growing beyond 8th Avenue. However, Chu says that had to change. This area along 8th Avenue, uh, obviously Lucky 8, um, uh, everybody loves 8. So no one wanted to be off 8th Avenue. What happened? What made them uh, finally decided? Well, it's, it's less about they don't want to be off 8th Avenue. It's more about because just to uh, uh, the left of 8th Avenue, which is 7th Avenue, is dominated by Hispanic, Latino, part, mostly Puerto Ricans at that time. Now it's Mexican, Puerto Ricans, and a mixture of other uh, South Americans. And then you go up, OK, which is um, Barrow Park, uh, it's dominated by Jewish. Um, so they mostly stuck to 8th Avenue, where they know. Um, and then uh, as the population had really exploded in the 90s, um, then they started um, uh, moving left and right, up and down um, the avenue. As the community grows, it is facing a litany of challenges, not enough schools, traffic snarls, and merchant robberies. We are stereotyped um, to always have cash. Uh, par partially it's true. Uh, and a lot of times, um, other folks that, that's looking to make a quick buck they can easily just come down here uh, and grab, okay, Chinese, okay, and, and pretty much, they're pretty much guaranteed to have some cash. Yi Yi Wang is a reporter with the Chinese newspaper World Journal. She has been on the beat for five years. She says unlike other Chinatowns, this community caters to recent immigrants from China who are mostly working class people escaping high rents in Manhattan and Flushing. I'm pretty sure like they're gonna have more and more people, more and more Asians to start running business in here and um, become more and more modern. You can see that East Avenue is more old, you know, it's a more old, old style. And um, if you can see from 7th Avenue, right now have more and more new stores on 7th Avenue, they become more and more younger group to open business right there. They are maybe the second generation for the uh, Chinese community, but they have more good idea, more new idea. It's a, even they're just a one street different, but you can see the total different right now. For Diverse City, I'm Gary Pierre Pierre. The Chinese community may play a large role in Sunset Park now. But not long ago, there was another group of immigrants making their mark on the area. I met up with Victoria Hoffman at the beginning of her walking tour that highlights the neighborhood's once vibrant Scandinavian community. So the soccer tavern is a big part of your tour. Tell me why is this the first stop? First of all, it's at the head of 8th Avenue, Lapskas Boulevard. Colloquially, Lapskas was a Norwegian stew, so they call this Lapskas Boulevard, heart of the community. And this is a place where they would have met. There's three soccer clubs nearby, Norwegian, Danish, and Swedish. And also there is a soccer field nearby, so it was a gathering place. And of course, there are a lot of sellers as well, so there's a lot of drinking going on. The other fun thing about here is they have a jukebox that has music from many different cultures. Norwegian, Polish, Italian, 
American and Chinese. Right. So they kept those songs, and I think that's a really cool thing. We should check it out. Let's go. Inside the tavern are scattered reminders of a sunset park that is now all but forgotten by most New Yorkers. Hofmo says that's because Norwegians don't like to talk about their accomplishments. There's a thing in um, Scandinavian culture and Norwegian called Jenteloven. It means people's law and it's, you're not supposed to brag. So there's a thing about them being humble, which can sometimes hurt them documenting themselves. As the founder and president of the Scandinavian East Coast Museum, Hofmo takes great pride in documenting that history. She gives walking tours of Sunset Park and Bay Ridge, highlighting architecture and institutions that was central to the Scandinavian immigrants who used to play a large role in the area. Why is this church particularly important to the Scandinavian well, first, culture? Churches are important in general to the Scandinavian culture, especially obviously Christian churches. And they're important because it's near Laps Gus Boulevard, but also because they have missions. Very often they came in to service the sailors that came in, but also this church in particular kept that legacy and they started outreaching to Chinese immigrants very, very early on, the first church that I know of to do so. so let's, uh, let's head on in. What are some of the other things that Scandinavians contributed to the community? I would say the three things I look at as a maritime history of New York, which is why it grew, especially in Brooklyn. I would say construction of the built environment, and I would say the social contract they have and how they implemented that in the city. And I think it comes from the church, that sense of social responsibility is very much a part of their culture. Whether they go to church or not, it's inbred in them. And I think the social contract is essential to who they are. So Scandinavians played a really big role in settling this region. When did they first arrive here? They come in large numbers to this area, I would say, towards the 1800s. So what kind of jobs did the Scandinavians hold when they got here? Mostly maritime trade. And they come in large numbers, but also they would have been engineers, teachers, everything. It's not one thing, it really runs the gamut. How did the Scandinavian East Coast Museum get started? Basically, I was in undergraduate school at Sarah Lawrence, and I was doing a lot of research on different ethnic groups, because I'm just interested in that. And then somebody asked me about my own background, and I became curious in that. And I did a paper on my undergraduate independent studies on Scandinavians in Bay Ridge, in Brooklyn, this area. Sunset Park and Bay Ridge, because at one time Sunset Park was Bay Ridge. And my professor really loved it. And then I decided to have an exhibition. And I wound up doing it at the Norwegian Siemens Church. Then what happened is people started handing me things. And so then these artifacts were given to me. And I was like, what am I going to do with this stuff? And that's sort of how it developed. And so where are all these artifacts stored? Now? We have a space actually in this church. We rent from them a space. And we also have a space through my church. But unfortunately, we have had a more um, secure space where, not secure, but a more organized space, and we haven't been able to keep that. We've been in storage units, et cetera, but I don't want to lose anything because without those documents, you don't have any proof of things. How many items would you say you have as part of your collection as a as kind of a general? Thousands, probably, mostly books, photographs. It's a real hodgepodge. I don't think having an archive and artifacts is interesting in itself. It's how we can use them and tell the story. I think doing walking tours is really popular and it gets people to see differently. I think just stopping and seeing differently, like if somebody says, oh, this is all Chinese, even Chinese students will say, Chinese Americans will say, oh, it's always been Chinese, but look at the architecture. I don't think we think about what's the architecture, what's the first language that people are speaking. You know, all those things contribute to that. So I don't expect ever for it to be like it was in its heyday. You know, I kind of grew up at the tail end of everything. I feel like I'm like following the parade in the circus, cleaning up after the elephant, kind of chasing the parade. And for me, the goal is to give a voice to these people and credit to what they contribute to the city and this coast, the East Coast, and then also share our culture with a larger audience. Finally, Greenwood Cemetery has been a part of Sunset Park's landscape since 1838. The grounds are more than a resting place for the dead. Andrew Falzone visited and found a place filled with art, history, and a life of its own. Driving down 25th Street en route to Greenwood Cemetery, it becomes abundantly clear that you're entering a different world, leaving behind the congested side streets of Sunset Park for a more tranquil setting. It's just a miraculous place which can be enjoyed on so many levels. And so whether you're a photographer, just walking around the cemetery looking for visuals or 
looking for stories uh, or trees or birds. Uh, it's just great that people can come in here and pick out what they like about the cemetery and then explore that. Jeff Richmond first came to Greenwood as an avid photographer looking to capture the cemetery's many scenic vistas in the 1980s. I was taken by the place. Uh, in fact, I got locked in here and had to climb through the fence to get out for a Mets game that evening. Now he's the cemetery historian. By 2007, it started to occur to me that I would be happier here than practicing law. So I suggested that we create a historian position, which had been filled last about 1885 when poor Nehemiah Cleveland, who's buried here, died. And so I became the second Greenwood Cemetery historian. While Greenwood's history goes all the way back to 1838, the history of some of the grounds go back even further to the Revolutionary War. Battle Hill is really a central place of the cemetery, originally called Mount Washington in honor of George Washington and was part of the Battle of Brooklyn, which was the first battle between American patriots and the British Army after the Declaration of Independence. Declaration of Independence, July 4th of 1776. This battle occurs August 27th of 1776, so just weeks later. And this could have very well have been the end of the American Revolution right here. And it is the largest battle of the American Revolution in terms of soldiers gathered on or about the field. The cemetery is also known for being the final resting place of many prominent Americans, like Samuel Morse, who invented the telegraph and is the forefather of modern electronic communication. He's honored with a massive memorial tower surrounded by the graves of family members. Morse is one of those few spots in the cemetery where they actually built up a hill as an honor to a famous person. It's just really a handful of those that were aggrandized in that way. And he was a tremendously important individual. If Morse's monument is a tribute to grandeur, the grave of composer, conductor, and pianist Leonard Bernstein is quite the opposite, an unassuming family plot that's easily overlooked, marked by some simple flat gravestones and a rather unique monument. He sat on that bench when he visited his wife, and so she died in 1978, and he lived for another 12 years before he came ultimately to Greenwood. The list of legends buried in the cemetery seems endless. The largest tomb in Greenwood belongs to the famous piano-making Steinway family. The structure contains enough space for 128 caskets on the main floor and then another 128 crypts in the basement below. The artist Jean-Michel Basquiat is buried here, as well as the infamous boss Tweed. Tweed spent the 1800s swindling New York City taxpayers out of the modern equivalent of nearly $4 billion. People talk about the Tweed Courthouse and how it's not such a bad building and whatever. It cost more money than two buildings being built at the same time, St. Patrick's Cathedral and the United States Capitol. So that gives you an idea of how much money they stole. So for those who come to the cemetery, whether it's for eternal rest or to seek solitude in the city, perhaps Greenwood represents a little bit of heaven here on Earth. I'm Andrew Falzone for Diversity on CUNY TV. Thanks for coming along with us on our walk through Sunset Park, Brooklyn this month. Join us next time when we'll head over to Long Island City, Queens, another changing waterfront community in our diverse city.